And welcome to today's conversation. Um, the conversation podcast today uh, has a special guest. is an entrepreneur, a TV, you know, station owner. is a pastor, but is also a veteran journalist. Today, I'm privileged to host Kennedy Mambwe, Pastor Kennedy Mambwe. Good day, Ambassador. It's uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for thinking of inviting me. Um, I've followed the podcast since you started. Uh, it's a very en enriching uh, platform. I hope you can evolve it into a TV or a radio station because you, you have got rich content and I think this is what the nation needs. Today I'm putting you on the spot. You are good at interviewing people. Today you're on the other side. Like I said, you're a veteran journalist, but many people may not know. Again, you are a pastor. Again, many people may not understand. Then they see you as a critic on TV. Again, they may not understand. Let's start. Who is Kennedy Mambwe? Well, Kennedy Mambwe, first and foremost, is a Zambian. Proud Zambian citizen. Um, born in uh, the land of uh, freedom fighters, Chinsali. So the, the, the blood of the Lenshina, the blood of uh, Kenneth Kaunda, the blood of Simon Monsaka Puepo, and all of them runs deep within me. Um, I was born in a family of um, uh, 11. Of course, now we are 10. Um, very, uh, you know, modest uh, background. And I uh, went to um, Lubwa Basic uh, School in Chinsali and across the Kolwe Stream. Uh, I went to Kenneth Kaunda Secondary School where I did my grade 10 to uh, <coughs> grade 12. And after that, um, that's when I thought of migrating to Lusaka like everybody else. So uh, predominantly I'm a villager from Chinsali um, and uh, much of uh, the formation of who I am uh, was from that perspective and all the historical perspective that I observed and that happened, and as you know, Kaunda um, was our founding father. And mm -hmm. he used to come to Chinsali, to Lubo in particular. And I used to belong to that church, the United Church of Zambia. So every other time that Kaunda would come, and I would be there as a young boy, and I was, uh, I was really beginning to feel some things uh, forming up in my mind as to where I should be going when I grow up. We. We can't trivialize Chinsali in the history of our country. It's like a spring of freedom for this country. Like you stated, 
the major names in this country in, fa in helping found this country. The first um, form of welfare association, which was like a trade union, was founded in Akonde area, but from people that came from Chinsali. The founding fathers, Simon Mwansaka Puepue, Kenneth David Kaunda, and others came from Chinsali. Uh, one of the first missions, Luwa, where you're privileged to have gone to, you know, is from Chinsali. And then the unspoken issue, the Lenshina uprising, where over 1,500 people were lost. Uh, it's Zambia's, I think, first massacre. So you were born in a very, very special place. Did you feel the history? Did you feel that sense of, uh, of history from Chins of Chinsali? So when, when I was young, all of these things never used to make sense until much later when I kind of began to develop a mindset of analyzing the context within which I was brought up. Within the Lubwa mission, you go up the hill where the Reverend Chulu and uh, Reverend Colombo and them used to, uh, to live. You go and read it, uh, built 1904 or 18 what, the Lubo itself, the mission is built uh, 18 this and whatnot. I'm like, why am I in such an area with this kind of uh, a history? And, and I began to uh, take keen interest. Uh, and Fetu would have it that my grandfather, um, would then become a, 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 a preacher, a lay preacher within the Lubwa uh, you know, mission, United Church of Zambia. So uh, all of this now became like, um, you know, a, a center pivot for me to galvanize who I, I am and the history that uh, surrounds me and who I should become in future. Because uh, now what happens is, as we are there, every Christmas, Dr. Kaunda would come to celebrate his uh, Christmas from, from, from Chinsali, the, the, the resting place. Because Dr. Kaunda, other than that, he had um, a special holiday home in, in Chinsali called Shambalakali. Correct. His, his, his father founded Lubwa Mission. Correct. And, uh, and both the graves for, for the father and his mother and lay right there. Right in front of the church. Right in front of the church. So I was just... To our dear viewers that may not understand why Dr. Kaunda would frequently come for his Christmas holidays and spend them in Chinsali. And interestingly, <coughs> now that you're mentioning about the resting place of Dr. Kaunda's parents, right in that graveyard facing the church is where my grandfather is resting. He's also, he's also okay. He's buried okay. there. So you can understand the connection and the richness of all of this. Now, for me, really what formed... Uh, you know, the upbringing as far as beginning to understand the historic context of Chinsali was the fact that every Christmas as Kaunda would come and I am there as a young boy, I began to see, oh, Kaunda landing in a you know, football pitch at uh, Luba Basic. And those days there were, there were cars we called the Belmont. <laughs> and the Belmont would pick him and the Silene would, would go, you know, and, and everyone, literally Luba Chinsali would come to a standstill when Kaunda is there the son of the soil is back home and so we would rush into church and what really for me the, the the most attractive of all of that was the jostling up and about of journalists and i see journalists getting close to power shoving a mic in front of the face of the the most revered president and i'm looking from afar as a young boy dirty and uh, you know uh, hungry and all of that and i'm like hmm what manner of profession is this that brings you this close to power? I think mm. when I grow up, I want to be like one of those who puts a camera in front of the president, who the only species in my view was not being stopped by the bodyguards from getting close Closer to, to, the to the president and take pictures. And I said, that is what I want to become. And ambassador, when I was growing up, that was the only conviction. Forget about mathematics and geography. I needed to know how to become a journalist. How to become a journalist. Mm. And mm. my focus much more was on English and all of this in literature and history became my favorite. And so it was not surprising that when I came to Lusaka and uh, you know, looked for a place to go, it was just two places. It's either University of Zambia for mass communication or Evelyn Horn College for journalism. 
University of Zambia at the time, uh, that was uh, 1997, that's when I was in, in college at Ivrin Horn College. Uh, University of Zambia was the only that was offering mass com uh, degree courses and it was highly competitive. I couldn't make it, so I found my way into Evelyn Horn College and that was my first exposure to journalism uh, training. Having been informed by what I experienced as, as, a, a, young, as, a, as young a young bar, child, boy yeah. in Chinsani. Mm. Ah, yes. okay, okay. Well, let's transition. You have come to Lusaka. You are now training as a journalist. Let's discuss your period of training up to your professional career and life. I believe that uh, every person you meet, you meet them for a purpose. I believe in the word of God that says the footsteps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. When I came into Lusaka, there were many churches to go to. By that time, I transitioned from UCZ into Pentecostal Assemblies of God. So when I came to Lusaka, I ended up in a place called um, George Compound and much later Matero. So that's, that's my uh, place where I, 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 I stayed when I came to Lusaka. So I looked for a church, Pentecostal Assemblies of God. I found a church in George Compound called, uh, it, it was called Mount Zion, but it was uh, Pentecostal, and the Assemblies. Pentecostal Assemblies. It yes. was uh, pastored uh, before I went there. It was pastored by a, a pastor called Pastor Campinda, who passed on, and then it was given to um, Bishop uh, Chirambo. Bishop Chirambo became my pastor and the family welcomed me. I somewhat became part of their family. Mm. Uh, his sons were my brothers, were my friends. And so what was most interesting about this you know, um, new family that I found was the fact that the wife to my pastor was a lecturer at Evelyn Horn College. So in my conversation with uh, her son, she overheard me saying, I really want to become a journalist, but I've been failing to get the place at Evelyn Horn College. Without me knowing, she went and talked to the head of journalism at Evelyn Horn College, said, I've got a son who wants to start journalism, but he doesn't seem to you know, be getting you know, the favors that he's looking for. Yeah. Can you create space for him? The, 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 the intake that I was in was way advanced. I think I was late by six months, but she fought, and she came and said, Kennedy, tomorrow you are starting school. I said, wow. how? <laughs> she said, yes, you are starting school at Evelyn Horn. I spoke to the head of department, you go and see such and such, and lo and behold, I showed up, and uh, I was welcomed, and that's how I became part of that class. Mm. So the, the, the difficult I had was now to play to catch up. up. For all the of months, six months. Yes, that I had uh, missed. But uh, I found uh, some good friends, like my good friend uh, uh, Lucy Kaonga, who is, a, uh, I think she's a station manager at one of the radio stations in Chingola, Kokoliko, or something like that. Uh, she became a good friend of mine and said, here are the notes, and I would copy. Uh, so I, in that class, I was with the likes of um, uh, Lusubi Logondwe, mm. who is a veteran uh, journalist also. Broadcaster at Radio at Phoenix. Radio Phoenix. Uh, mm. I was with the likes of uh, Ingutu Imanje, mm. uh, who is now and a council. Mm. You know, so mm. that, that is my, that's my intake. And uh, after I, I, I finished my, 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 my studies with um, um, you know, Everyn Horn College, I started working as a freelance journalist. And uh, much of my work was with... Uh, Reuters, news agents, and Bloomberg. So not so much with the local uh, media times and, and all of that, but I had a, a, a weekly column in the Post newspaper. Um, I can't remember what we called it, but I had a weekly, cost, a, a weekly column in the, in the Post. Um, and uh, Ambassador, you also realize that when I worked for a journalist, as a journalist for uh, some years, I realized that uh, I needed to upgrade myself. Yeah. I needed to upgrade my studies. And uh, I applied to go and start um, for a master's degree in journalism still in the United Kingdom as a self-sponsored uh, you know, student. Didn't have money. Mm -hmm. I just had the passion. But I knew I needed to upgrade myself. When I looked at how much I needed to pay, how much it was, it was going to cost me 40,000 uh, pounds 
for two years to start a master's and I didn't have any money. And then I didn't have the ticket. There was an organization called Media Trust Fund. Mm -hmm. Beston Ngonga was the executive director at the time. Yeah, former managing director at, Z at Times of Zambia. Yes. I wrote to him, I said, listen, I, I'm looking for sponsorship for an air ticket to go and study. Here is my acceptance letter at City University mm. in London. And he said to me, we can't fund you. Maybe as, because at that time, uh, just to uh, uh, back up a little bit, at that time, Ambassador, in uh, the year 1999, uh, no, no, in, yeah, 1999, I became the first journalist to form what we called online news um, channel, so to speak. It was called the Information Dispatch Online. Oh, the Information Dispatch Online. Yes, 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 yes. Information Dispatch was the first online news uh, platform. Outlet. Outlet. Yeah. And we used to operate from, uh, um, you know, a business cafe at uh, that hotel, uh, uh, you know, the, the hotel near Pamozi. Um, Southern Sun, Holiday Southern Inn at the Sun, time. Yes. Now, mm. there used to be a cafe uh, where uh, business, a, a man by the name of Paul Gosson, mm. used to operate a, bi a, 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 a... That time, the internet was very fresh and new in Zambia. Yeah. So there were yeah. very few, you know, Places you could cafes. go for. You had to go to the British Council yes. so he or Business or yes. Zamnet. Yes, he embraced mm. us. We had uh, an organization called uh, IICD, International Something Something for Development in Netherlands, that said, uh, we, we will ha like to help you with some rentals and paying of internet so you can keep the information flowing. Mm. So and what so, were you doing with the information dispatch? So with the information dispatch, we formed a, a, a small team uh, of the likes of uh, Gideon, Gideon Tolle, Kasonde Kasolo, myself, and a few others, we would collect news. And instead of news, you're waiting that time, you wait for the Post, for the Times of Zambia to report it, or you have to wait for ZNBC or Phoenix to report at 13. Now, for us, what we used to do, you collect news, you break it through that you know, channel called Information Dispatch. So we were saying instant news. Mm. So we were mm. breaking news instantly. Now, um, that became a very popular, because in 20, 2001, Chiluba, you know, uh, was vying for um, the third term. The there third was an attempt term. for a third term, yes. You know, and uh, we, for, for the Zambians in the diaspora, we became a very famous... Reliable channel. Channel of... Source of news. Yes, for them to hear what's happening you know, you know, back home, mm. okay? And I, I, I will say some things that I've never disclosed some things, uh, uh, you know, in, in the course of... Uh, That's the beauty of the conversation. Of, 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 <laughs> of duty, you know, what happened to me. And, mm. and, I, and as you said, people must understand my passion for journalism and where mm. I, am, I am coming from. Mm. So I am running the information dispatch. By the way, it is now what is called Lusaka Times. Yeah. Because um, I, I, I exited, and the people that uh, believed in its uh, potential embraced it. And it's still there, Lusaka Times is what I started as information dispatch, dispatch yeah. back, back in, the, in, the, in the years. 1999, yes. yeah. Now, look at how audacious I was as a young journalist, very naive. Uh, 20, 2001, President Shluba is uh, you know, planning to run for a third term. It was very tense. Now, I'm going to say some things in my course of journalism that I've never said publicly. Yeah. I am working on a Sunday. And because the information dispatch was very popular with the audience in the diaspora, I received an email from some gentleman called Yus Yusa Yusuf, Yusuf something, something, okay? That uh, there's a time, uh, Ambassador, when the president was out of the country for over a month, and people were questioning, where is the president? The president was quiet as to where the president was. The cabinet was quiet as to where President Chilwa was. And here is a young, naive journalist. I get information that the president is not in the country and has not come back. He's not available. He's not available. He's mm. in, a, in a foreign country, and I, I was told he's in uh, France. He's in France because he, he was there with the head of intelligence, okay? 
And uh, the head of intelligence was carrying hard cash in dollars. And so he's been arrested by the French you know, uh, government. That's why the president cannot come, because he's fighting hard to have the, the, the head of intelligence released. Then he can come back. Now, I, I was very confused, because this information was very delicate, was very sensitive. And I didn't have the, 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 the expertise that I have now mm. as a journalist. To say, how do I verify how this? How do I verify this information? Mm. It's in the public interest. Our president, yes, has not been back for this one month. It's been a long time. So, but how do I verify? And guess what? Mm. In my naivety, I live where I was operating from, at uh, Southern Sun. And I take a walk to the Red Brick, which is the headquarters of the, the intelligence. The Zambia Intelligence Security Services in this country. In this country. And with that naivety, I find a gentleman wearing a red barret and green, and I say, excuse, excuse me, my name is Kenneth Mambwe. I'm a journalist from the Information Dispatch. And I produce my ID from Zanis. Yeah. And it says Information Dispatch Managing Editor Kenneth Mambwe. Then he said, how can I help you? I said, I just want you to confirm. Is it true that the president, President Chiluba, is out, of the is out of the country and the reason he's not back is because the head of intelligence at that time was Mr. Xavier Chiong, mm. has been arrested. Is it true? And the gentleman just said, I am coming, wait here. And I stood there at the front gate of the red brick and <laughs> my heart told me, you are in double trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you are in trouble. Run for your life. I started running in the direction of um, Skanze Camp. Now, you know there is what they call friendly forces. So Skanze Camp predominantly is it's a for camp the for the police. So when the policemen saw me being now, uh, when I, you look back, there was a green Land Rover with a white top with the red barret you know, officers from the intelligence. Looking for you. Looking for me now, driving behind me with guns in the, in the air. And the police in front of me, and as I said, I'm saying this publicly for the first time. Yeah. It's something yeah. I've curbed. Mm. But I, I want people to know my passion of journalism, yeah. where yeah. it comes from, mm. and uh, what I have gone through. It's a conversation. You don't have to apologize. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so when the police saw I'm being chased by a friendly force, I was attacked by the police and I went flying. Literally, mm. by the time I was landing, a boot was on my neck mm. and I was bruised and kicked and I was lifted and they told me to f lie in that you know, Land Rover facing down. down. Mm. And they drove me back to the red brick with my face down. And I was locked into some dark room, not too far from the main entrance. There's some, maybe it's an interrogation room. That's where I was, I was kept, and the, the people disappeared, and I think they were making some national alarms, and said there is a young man we have arrested, but we have checked him. He has a, he's a journalist. He's a journalist we've verified. And I think at, after some time, someone told them, yes, we know him, release him. And that's how I was released. I disappeared. Now that was very dark. I disappeared, and I was staying in Kabwata, some flights there. I disappeared into the dark, and uh, I went home. I called my fiancé then, who is my wife now, and I said, please come, I've been beaten, I've been bruised. Mm. And when she, she asked for permission from my mother, they let her come. Mm. And um, you know, she said, I want you to stop this. This is not the kind of job you should be doing. Look, it's, it's, too, it's mm. too early for you to be facing these kind of uh, you know, things. What did you do with that information? Did you let her have it published? No. So what I said, um, I said to... Uh, the gentlemen, when they, uh, they released me, I said to them, I will not publish this information. I'm a journalist, law-abiding, and I believe in the principles of journalism. We in fact, that's why you are calling it naive. That's why you walked over to the yes. intelligence to try to verify the information. Yes. Yes. It's one of the ethics we receive yes. information you have to ensure that before it's published, it's verifiable. So you were doing I a was, verification process. I, I was doing a due diligence <laughs> that landed me in trouble. Yeah. You, you know, now, here, I told them, I said, look, I will not publish this information if you think it's not credible enough. Um, 
so I gave them my word. And that information was never published until now, now yeah. on the podcast. But did you, did you verify if, for example, the president was out of the country for that period? The president was uh, definitely out of the country for that period, but here is what happened. Mm -hmm. After the passage of time, and I think this was about um, after maybe a, a week or two, a Land Rover, a white Land Rover was sent to come and pick me up. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman who, who came to pick me up said some things that I, I didn't know what it meant. They just said, Delta One wants to see you. And I said, Delta One, what's that? So I complied. But at that time, I told my journalist and I said, look, guys, I am going this way. If I don't come, if I don't show up, if anything happens, I want you to know this is what's at play. Yeah. At least now I had to confide in mm. some of the journalists I was working with at mm. the time. And so I was whisked in that brand new white Land Rover into the red brick. Uh, and they opened the escalator or the elevator, the elevator rather. And I, I, I was walked into that elevator and we went all the way to some floor. When the door to the elevator opened, guess where I was ushered? I was ushered right into the presence of the head of intelligence, mm, mm, mm. Mr. Seves Young. Yeah. I was seeing him for the first time in person. He stood up, came warmly, <laughs> welcomed me and shook my hand. And uh, I was young, he's an elderly person. Yeah. The respect he gave me, uh, I was melting with admiration mm, of, mm. of the professionalism. Mm. And he said, Mr. Mambwe, Mm. Welcome. My name is Xavier Chung. I just called, you know, to apologize personally for how you were treated when you were investigating a, a story, story as a mm. journalist. Mm. My heart inside was melting and I was like, wow, mm. these mm. guys are professionals. Yeah. yeah. I admire their work, work mm. ethic. To be mm. invited by a man uh, I was told was arrested in some foreign country. And he said to me, I like the fact that you didn't publish that story. Mm. I know if it was, but back then the, the biggest newspaper was the Post. Yeah. He said to me, I know if it was the Post, they would have gone to ahead run to mm. publish. But the fact that you came, I just thought I needed to come and apologize for how we treated you. You should have asked him, DG, but by the way, were you arrested? <laughs> <laughs> no ways. My heart there you, still no, was No, no, like, no, you were just shocked. That, I was uh, very shocked. You were ushered in his presence. Yes, at and, the turn of events. Yeah. But then yeah. as a journalist, uh, at the back of my mind, I'm like, <clears throat> if there was no truth to all of this, why we would... The dramatic... Um, why, why, why would I be actually... You know, how, why do I find myself in, in this... But it was a very cordial conversation, and they said, I just wanted to know you, and I wanted you to know me, and uh, I, if, if you need anything, let us know. I said, mm. no problem. I, my heart was like, get me out of this place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. And after shaking a few hands, uh, and uh, he ushered me out to the staircase, and out I, I went. That was my baptism into journalism. Mm. I can mm. never forget that. Mm. And uh, after that, I said I needed to, to, to go and uh, up, upgrade myself. And mm. you recall, I'd, earlier talked about how I went to the Media Trust Fund uh, to look for sponsorship for an air ticket. And they said, we, we, we can't fund that. And so Mr. Beston Ningonga told me, uh, write and ask for funding for um, maybe equipment or a laptop or a, a, and then once we raise that funding and then uh, maybe you see what you can do to convert it to convert to, it to your mm. air ticket but at least in our books it will show that we supported the journalist an upcoming media house with this mm. and true to his suggestion I did an application and they helped me and I got an air ticket ambassador by the time I was la uh, landing in uh, London at Heathrow Airport that was my first time to go to the, to the United Kingdom. I was landing there with only 500 pounds, and I was going to study a course worth 40,000 of pounds, mm. millions in Kwacha at the time. True. Mm. Even now. Mm. 
Why did I do that? I'm a man of faith. My upbringing where I, br I was brought up was a very difficult environment. But by the grace of God, God saw me through college. God saw me through my first exposure to journalism practice. And I believe that same God who has brought me safe this far surely will be faithful enough to take me to London. No relative, no one I knew in London, but I landed. And I was uh, received in the halls of residence at City University. This is your room. I look, it has got everything. There's a bed, there's a table, there's a where to cook from and all of that. But I have to be paying per, per week the rentals. Mm. How will I survive? And I had 500. Within a week, my 500 pounds was gone. gone. And for the first time, I received a letter from the lawyers who were manning the halls of residence that uh, you haven't paid your, your rentals. We are going to prosecute you or to sue you or you need to go out. I'm like, Lord, how do I survive in a foreign country? Then I remembered that when I was leaving Zambia, someone I used to go to church with gave me dry carpenter, dry beans, and all of those, and said, go and look for my brother in London. Here is his number. Before then, I was hesitating, because I didn't even know my... Your way. Mm. But finally, I realized, for me to survive, I need to look for this person, who now is a brother and a friend. I, I contacted him and I said, listen, I am Kenneth Mambwe. I'm here for my studies at City mm -hmm. University, but your brother gave me candolo, beans, you know, and all of those. Uh, please come to such and such a place in, in central London. Come and collect. But for me, my prayer was God. When he comes, please, <laughs> may this be my survival. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he came. We greeted, and I introduced myself, and I said, here is your uh, dried consignment. And then I said, before you carry this, I want you to know, read this letter. I have been saved with a, an eviction notice. And so, you have to help me. I don't know anyone here. Then he said, okay, give me up to tomorrow. Let me go and talk to my brother and my sister. We'll see what we can do. He went, and uh, true to his word, the following day he drove back and said, I've spoken to my brother and my sister, we can accommodate you for now while mm. you're finding your feet. Your feet. Hey, God is, God is merciful. Mm. They accommodated me. I became part of the family. Um, and uh, in, in, in between now, I started working as a waiter yeah. Yeah. to raise money mm. to sponsor for my studies. Wow. And uh, one of the most memorable days, Ambassador, is that the agents where I was affiliated as a waiter sent me to the mayor of London's office. Ken Livingstone mm. was the mayor of London at the time. And he was having a press conference. And the agents said, go and be the one to cover, to provide tea and coffee and all of this to the journalists who will be covering the press conference of Mayor Ken Livingstone. And I went there. And I stood by the corner waiting for the mayor to finish speaking in my heart. I'm like, I'm a journalist, and what am I doing serving tea? Mm, mm, mm. But something in me said, you need to go through this. It doesn't mean you're not a journalist. You are a journalist. Yeah. You are here to upgrade yourself. So go through this phase. It's just a phase. Mm. It will come to an end. I served. They finished the conference. I served the journalist and whatnot. I, I just pretended like I don't know. But in my mind, I was even saying the story, the intro for this story would be <laughs> like <laughs> this, like this. But anyway, I was there to save tea and coffees. And uh, of, to cut the long story sh short, I braved myself, but it was very intense for me to, to, to remain. To be, to be both at work yes. and at school. Yes. I dropped mm. off university, city university, and uh, I went now into full time working to raise money. And I said to myself, when I have raised enough money, I will then change the university because they will not accept me to go back. And mm. fortunately, when I raised a bit of money, um, remember I wasn't paying rentals at 
a certain in, time. Yeah. Mm. So I, they gave me quite a buffer to raise a bit of money. And then I applied for uh, another course at the uh, University of Westminster, mm. still Masters in Journalism. And they accepted me. Mm. But was, what was very shocking is they do not accept full-time um, international students. No, no, they don't accept international st students on part-time. You have to be a full-time student. You have to be a full-time student as an international student. What was shocking for me, they didn't ask, are you Zambian? Are you, do you have a permanent residence? What? No, they accepted me as a part-time student studying uh, uh, journalism and as a part-time. Mm, mm. So that I could continue working as a waiter to fund my studies. Mm, mm. And I did that, and I finished the day I was writing my dissertation. I already bought a ticket. I didn't want to stay in London. Any further. Any further, because mm. for me, that was not my environment. My mm. passion was to come back home <laughs> and mm. contribute to the development of my nation. Mm. The day I submitted my dissertation, the following day, I jumped on a flight. Now, because I didn't have money, I needed to look for the cheapest flight. Yeah. I yeah. had to look yeah. for a flight around Christmas. Mm -hmm. when, uh, when the entire world is traveling. Actually, they're not traveling because they, they are very few people. It's holiday time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. The, the flights become a bit cheaper. Mm -hmm. and, but for me, it's not a direct flight. I jumped on a flight that went first to, to uh, Rome in Italy, from Italy to Addis Ababa, and from Addis Ababa to Nairobi, from Nairobi to um, Malawi, and then Lusaka. It took me like three days to arrive. Why? Because I just needed a cheap flight. Mm. Mm. I've been a fighter the rest of my life, so mm. um, I, I am here having a conversation with the ambassador mm. uh, to just tell my story. So from the journalism journey, yeah, yeah. That's where I am coming from. And when I came, I went straight into the practice of public relations. Okay, okay. Um, we formed uh, an, a, 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 a PR agency called ZK Advertising. At the time, Seotel was the biggest um, <laughs> mobile company, mm. and uh, they had they had um, they had um, uh, an agency that was coming out of Dar es Salaam, which was given the contract to manage the the PR and advertising side of Seotel, and that needed to open up offices across Africa. And so I was privileged to be hired as the, the first public relations manager for Seotel, managing Seotel as a brand, but from the agent's perspective. Mm. And I did that uh, for a, a bit, but because Seotel saw the value that I was bringing to the brand, uh, Mr. Norman Moyo, the marketing director at the time, said to me, Kenneth, why, why don't you come and join us? Join us officially. Uh, officially as part of the marketing in, in, in Seotel. I said, uh, by all means. So I transitioned from being a journalist to becoming a PR person and now to becoming a marketing person. So mm. I became a marketing services um, manager for, for Seotel. I took over from a dear brother and colleague, uh, Chris Porter at the time. Mm. Um, and so I, 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 I became now fully fledged working with the PS uh, uh, Evans Mohanga, who later went to to Zamtel. To, to no, no, to Sierra Leone oh. as director. Mm. So when he left, under the hotel, under the hotel. Mm. So I uh, worked with them, and, and um, we drove the brand until we rebranded Seotel to Zen. Mm. It was after we rebranded Seotel uh, to Zen that uh, I left to now practice PR consultants, uh, which I was doing for a number of, uh, of uh, firms. firms. So, um, but then, just when I was getting entrenched in practicing uh, PR consultants on my own, uh, the PF, uh, uh, no, 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 uh, um, I'm trying to, to recall the events. Mm -hmm. uh, Seotel, uh, Zamtel had been sold to Lap Green. Yeah. Of, uh, of, Libya of Libya by the MMD government, government of uh, uh, President Rupia Banda. And so when, uh, when, when, when uh, MMD sold Zamtel to, to, to Lapgreen of, of Libya, they were looking for a PR, a strong PR person who could help. Because remember that time, 
uh, Zamteo uh, was yellow. Uh, it was a lethargic, uh, lethargic brand. It was regarded for the old Madalas. And we needed to rebrand and revamp it so that it can be competitive, mm -hmm. like MTN. And, and uh, So I was privileged to be one of the first to be hired. I became the PR person for, for, um, for Zamteo working with uh, Amon Jerry and, uh, and uh, Eve Banda and, and all of those. And so we rebranded um, Zamtel. But when there was change of government, 2011, 11. the PF needed to hand back, uh, you know. President Michael Sata. Yeah. I think did an inquiry and ordered that yes. uh, it must the, be reversed. the transaction was uh, should be reversed yes. on account that it was illegal. Yes. yes. And he did uh, a unilateral decision where yes. lab green were yes. uh, removed. Yes. And it, Zamteo reverted to the old status. Of course, uh, then there was a legal process after that. So, uh, but Zamteo came back Zamteo as a stand-out state-owned enterprise. Zamteo came back. So now, as a PR and communications manager, I was. Uh, uh, at the thick of communication to, to, to manage changes. that delicate transition. Both internally and outside. Internally and externally. So it was a very delicate, uh, but it also gave me a lot of exposure, engagement, stakeholder management <coughs> and all of that because you're working with politicians, you're working with uh, investors, uh, foreign investors and all of these things and media and so on and so forth. So it was a very good you know, place to be for me, at least, you know, to, to understand how politics work, how decisions are made, how to manage delicate situations and transitions and all of this. And I was at the, but for me, my practice of uh, you know, PR is not that I should be the one in, in, in front. I would craft all these statements and let my bosses be the ones. So most mm. people that don't know that I've been at that level because I was, Always in the background. Always in the background, mm. making things uh, happen mm. and making my bosses look good. Yeah. And, and so that yeah. was uh, uh, what happened uh, to me until at the time um, when I was in Zamtel, Ambassador, is when the idea to start a TV station was birthed. Mm. Because it was at that time that now the digital migration framework was being rolled out and uh, I didn't even know. But I stumbled mm. into it. And I came to realize that, oh, there is a digital migration you know, uh, framework that the government is promoting, and any Zambian can start a TV station. And I said, why, why wouldn't I be part of mm. the history to you know, uh, benefit from such a wonderful development? I think I would like to be a part of But the challenge was, how do you start a TV station? I mm. did my own survey and study. I realized it's a lot of money that was required. But I consulted my wife, who became a partner in, in, in KBN. In the TV station project. And I said to her, my friend, look, we've been together. We've built this and that and that. We have a little bit of somewhere to, to start from. Can we sacrifice some of this and invest in a TV uh, station? She said, are you sure? I said, look, look at ZNBC. Look at Prime TV. Look at maybe, just maybe in future. Mm -hmm. let's, let's try this. And she said, not a problem. Fortunately for me, I was in gainful employment at uh, Zamteo. I had a good salary as a manager, a car, personal to order, and all of these things taken care of. So I didn't have enough demand on my extra income. So when we, we registered the, the, the brand KBN TV, I would get my salary literally from, from what I was earning at Zamtel to go and pay people who were working at, uh, at um, KBN. At KBN. Wow. You know? But in terms of buying equipment, we had to, to sell this and sell that. Uh, um, put our house on mortgage and so on and so forth. And, and then that is what we use. The project has come at great su personal sacrifice. At know. a great personal sacrifice. And, and, and that's why sometimes when uh, we are doing what we're doing as KBN and we have taken an editorial stance of how mm -hmm. we should project the, the, the discourse in the nation because we believe maybe what is in public uh, interest is this and that. And when I hear people say, you know, when PF were in power, we were one of the very few platforms where the UPND would come. Um, uh, you know, the vice president, uh, um, her owner, uh, Madam Narumango, was my regular on State of the Nation. And uh, all of them, uh, you recall, when Vakwetu was being run by my friend and, and, and the older motion. brother, uh, um, Norman Chipakupaku, and my brother Elias Moensha, 
uh, was at the time in, in, in uh, Canada. In, in, in Canada. They asked me, look, we have Wakwetu TV, how can we get some of this feed and plug it on KB? And I said, by all means, look, you are, you are discussing things that uh, you know, concern the nation. So we would get to Wakwetu, we signed uh, an MOU, the podcast of Wakwetu, we plug it into a mainstream uh, KBN TV. And we were a darling station for the UPND. I, I hosted the, the president himself on State of the Nation uh, virtually from his community house uh, for over one and a half hours on State of the Nation. KBN was a darling of the UPND in opposition. And the PF, uh, of course, they knew that uh, we were not funded by the, by the UPND. They never called us a project of the UPND, of course, uh, because they had all the information uh, on their their disposal, that they know how much of a sacrifice it was to start a TV station by, my, by myself and my wife and my family. And so it is very shocking today when I, I hear the same TV station that benefited the UPND. Today the discourse has changed. Oh, this car PF can timber. Oh, this PF funded uh, you know, project. They do not know at what sacrifice, a great sacrifice, we built the brand KBN over the past five years. Yeah. So yeah. it's very painful for me, you know, to hear people who are actually supposed to be saying, you know what, let's support uh, that. Maybe through economic empowerment, let's find a, a way of supporting media because media is hardly, hardly supported. Mm. They mm. would support agriculture, they would support everything but media. Mm. And yet media, everyone wants to use media to advance mm. their their cause and, and so on and so forth. So this is where we are. And mm. uh, KBN has never been um, a, a, a PF outfit, has never been a UPND outfit. It has been a people's outfit. It was born out of conviction that... Uh, and because they, of national interest. Because of national interest. For mm. me and my team, whatever we would do, at the center of it all must be national interest. And that is why... This is where I draw my, my strength from when you say I, I would perhaps be a critic of the, of the government. Mm. I'm not a critic of the government. I'm yeah. only asking questions. What you are deciding to do and what you are doing, does this benefit the nation or does mm. it benefit you and your family and your clique? So when we ask those tough questions, we are not being personal. We are asking you asked for a vote so that you can run the affairs of the nation the Zambian people deposited their trust in you. Why are you betraying their trust? And I have a whole catalog of things that I feel the UPND government has negated its commitment, has gone back, has backpedaled on its commitment to the Zambian people. There is a whole list of things I can talk about on this podcast or any other day. And when we do this, Ambassador, for me personally, mm, speaking mm, mm. as a Zambian, it's yeah. because I love Zambia, I love this government, I love the, any other leader. And the, the space where the media occupy is a space that must promote dialogue, mm. is a space that must promote free expression, freedom of expression, and we must never be scared. I personally, mm. I am never scared, as mm. long as I'm within the confines of the law, as long as I am doing what is right for the nation. At the end of it all, it must benefit the nation. I take great exception to the ill-informed cadres who will always attack and call me a fake pastor uh, who has been supported by the PF. Show me. Show me the money of the PF. Mm -hmm. Show me when uh, anyone gave me money. Yeah. No. Well, before we come to the critics, they, 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 they praise singers are not critics. Because their criticism is not founded in truth, it's not founded, it's founded in malice. So, you are a pastor, um, and your young brother is also a pastor, Emmanuel. Just tell us about your journey. I know you are a born again, Bible believing man, but are you a lay pastor? Did you study pastoral work? Uh, how did you become a pastor? How are you a pastor? Are you running a church? Just speak to that. Because right. that's the other life people don't know. Yeah. We have now walked with you on the journey of journalism and uh, journalism practice to PR, uh, practice your consultancy. Tell us about your journey as a pastor. And if you're running any church, then we transition to 
reviewing how this country is being run by right. going through the lenses of our previous presidents up to the current one. Right. Ambassador, I, I was privileged to, to be brought up in a family that fears God and loves God. Um, our, our parents didn't have much to give us, but I really am grateful to God for what they gave us. They gave us the fear of God. They gave us the values of life, respect for the elders, respect for others, and uh, the, the secret of coexistence. That's why for me, because of my upbringing, I have never looked at any Zambian in the lens of uh, where they come from, for instance. I have friends, I am married to a, a beautiful old woman, because for me, where one comes from has never been an issue. Yeah. So yeah. as a young person, my family really brought us up well in, in a Christian home, first of all, in the United Church uh, of Zambia. But when we were grown up enough to make our own conscious decisions, we found ourselves in Pentecost Assemblies of God when we became as what is popularly known as born again. Because you realize at a, a certain place, you must recognize that you are a sinner. Yeah. You were born a sinner. And mm. it's not because of the sprinkling of water on your head that saves you, but yeah. by the confession with your mouth and believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died, was crucified, and on the third day, he rose from the dead. And the Bible tells us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and you know, just to, you know, to, to cleanse us and forgive us of all our unrighteousness. So when you reach that place of making a conscious decision of confessing your sins, Mm. and accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you are born again. And that, I went through that transition along with my, my, brother, uh, my brothers and my, my sisters. Um, we, we, we grew up like that. And uh, as we progressed in our walk with the Lord, we found ourselves knowing the scriptures, knowing how, what it means to walk with the Lord, uh, knowing that uh, even a, a, a believer is just a sinner, but when you sin and you fall, there is sufficient grace you can go back to the cross and say, Father, I am a sinner, I've fallen, I've fallen short of your glory, and the Lord will embrace you and, 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 and be with you. So that's what has been for me, and um, um, becoming a worshiper, a mm. praise, wo praise and worship leader, uh, becoming a deacon um, in, in, in church, and serving as a deacon in different you know, areas, um, in missions, um, in uh, running cell, cell groups and so on and so forth. And when I had served um, for a number of years as a deacon, I think my pastor saw my passion. I never saw passion myself, you know, for the work of God. But I think my pastor saw my passion for, for the work of God. And uh, we had to undergo internal training, not necessarily going to a Bible college. Mm. We had to undergo through a rigorous uh, pastoral training uh, in-house and later on I was ordained as a pastor so I'm not just a lay person yeah and no, I'm ordained, ordained pastor of the gospel mm -hmm. and I, I worked um, with uh, my pastor um, for for a number of years I think up to maybe 13 years or thereabout and at some point uh, in in 2018 I was I was his assistant pastor and that later on, I was the assistant uh, uh, pastor for in charge of missions. Mm. Uh, so I ha we had, um, and this is Pastor Bruce Msidi, who was my mm. pastor. He's the one who ordained me from Mount Zion mm. Christian Center. Mm. And uh, under him, uh, I was assisting as the set man of the ministry. And uh, the ministry grew uh, so much that um, he asked me to be overseer of uh, branch churches. Okay. So under me, I had about seven pastors in different parts of the country that uh, were reporting into me and then I was reporting back um, into, the, into the senior pastor. But at, by 2018, I really felt a conviction and uh, the Lord uh, leading me that my training uh, was, was, complete. was complete. I didn't know where the Lord uh, was uh, taking me. Um, at the time, I just understood that I think if the Lord is saying your training here is complete, uh, it means I need to go and start a church. Um, that's what I thought, and that's a conviction that I, I had. And so I went through the motions of registering a ministry and starting. And for the past uh, five years or so, at, almost at the same time that I was starting KBN, I was also starting a church. Ah. So I birthed two 
two projects at uh, the same time at the same time uh, running a, a church as well as running um, a ministry and i've been running with a church called dominion christian center where i have been a founder and, and and senior pastor for the past five years but in the same five years there's been a lot of demand on me for the national assignment of running a tv station that has become a big national platform because kbn tv is uh, on all platforms it's on dstv it's on go tv it is on uh, uh, top stand it on social media so it is as big as ZNBC in a, in a nutshell because wherever yeah. ZNBC broadcasts from uh, through whichever platform that's where we also broadcast through. so we mm -hmm. are a national outfit yeah. so uh, with over uh, with over five years of running the church and the and the TV station there's been a huge demand on my life and I'm failing to split myself evenly and commit so uh, I have had uh, in the last one month I've had to take a, a, a back seat from church um, and, and I'm focusing more on the national mandate of running a, a, a media that can provide balance mm. uh, and, and, and embrace divergent views and create a balance that uh, somewhat has been um, missing over time. So that's where I am. I am I'm a full commissioned and ordained uh, minister of the gospel and uh, at, at the same time, I'm a business person, um, but I really don't look at KBN as, 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 as a business. I look at it as a calling, um, because a business, you are more focused on, uh, on profit. On profit. Mm. And if you're focused on profit, some things will be going wrong in the country, and you focus on profit and say, if I talk about this, I will, I'll not, have the I will not have business, so mm. I would rather focus on business and not talk about this. But for us at KBN, we, we regard what God has placed in our hands as a calling, and so we take it with that reverence. And so when we embrace the platform and uh, bring about uh, divergent views, it is because this is as unto the Lord, mm -hmm. not to um, uh, not to um, demonize anyone, but to just ask. There's one thing that I learned as a Christian. We, we used to wear armbands. Yeah. WWW. Uh, w. What would Jesus do? WWW. D. Mm -hmm. What would oh, Jesus do? Okay? So every time we find ourselves in a situation, we ask ourselves, if it was Jesus running a platform, what would Jesus ask? Mm. Will he ask only because the Pharisees want to be addressed in a certain way? No. He would ask them and say, why have you turned my house into a, a house of, uh, of, of thieves? They turned the, the, that, that place where they were selling in, in, in the temple. Jesus went there. You know, even John the Baptist called them, you brood of vipers, who, had, who has warned you, you know, to run away from the wrath of God that is coming. So when you look at the word of God and when you look at justice, yeah. when you look at fairness, fairness has nothing to do with fear. Justice has nothing to do with fear. And, you know, in the eyes of God, Ambassador, it is God that... Uh, and this is one thing that politicians must understand. And for me, yeah. when I'm doing my job as a journalist, I also mirror it against what the Bible says. Mm. The Bible says it is God that raises another and brings another one down. down. Because promotion comes from God. from God. Do you know that it is God that anointed Saul as king? Yeah. It is the same God that said, I have rejected Saul because as he has sinned against me. So when I am doing my job, I say in all of this, God... What must we do and what must be said about this? Not because I love Ambassador and I know him personally. And for me, you'll be surprised, I love everyone in government. Mm. And most of them are my personal friends. Mm. I have friends who are ministers. Mm. Rodney is my friend. We work together in Seotel. We work together in, 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 in Zamtel. Evans Mwanga is, is, is my uh, elder brother uh, and, and friend and colleague. I worked with him in Seotel. I worked with him in Zamtel. Uh, Norman Chipakupako, the minister, I mean the PS of defense, is my elder brother and friend. I, when I was studying in England, I would go to Scotland and stay with him in his, in his house. I have a lot of friends in, in this government, but it's not about my personal friendship with them. It is, are you doing the right thing? So when we are questioning as journalists, it's not that we hate you. We are saying, mm. is this what you promised? Mm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Let's transition to the president. This country is, is now clocked 60 years since its foundation. And there are things we could have done 
Well, there are things you could have done better. Through your views, President Kaunda, what's your review of him? What did he do well? What could he have done better? So President Kaunda, first of all, we give him credit for having sacrificed a lot. He's one person who would leave his family going to the bush and traverse the length and breadth of the nation uh, to mobilize for the liberation of our nation so that Zambia can become independent. For that, we give him all the, you know, the recognition for the efforts that he had put in, together with the team that he worked with. He is one man that even when he constituted the first cabinet, it was reflective of the one Zambia, one nation. Because the first cabinet of Kaunda had everybody from every quarter or, or section of our society. A teacher, a trade unionist, uh, a, a Tonga, a Bemba, a Lozi. Everyone had a part and it really felt like this is a truly, um, you know, Zambian cabinet mm. reflecting who we are as, as a people. Mm. Uh, President Kaunda built the infrastructure like the Ta 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 Tazama pipeline, you know, uh, the railways and all of those. He built the University of Zambia and, and so on and so forth. The Kariba Dam. He was big on making sure that the, the, the country had infrastructure that is sustainable into the future. But I think that President Kaunda lost it along the way. Lost it along the way when we found ourselves into a one-party state. Mm, and mm. President Kaunda felt that he has become too big. He became too big that he was uncontrollable to the extent that he began to say, Kumulu ni lesa. Panshi ni Kaunda. He began to equate himself to the deity. He, became, he, became, he became so big and thought that no one can challenge him. That's why I like when President Chiluba came and started his campaign. He said, Vale mieva ti Kaunda mulilo. Ua ikatako apia. I remember him on uh, you know, uh, one of the campaigns when he came to Chinsa. He said, Ushena alipia mueve na Chinsa li. And we all said, no. He said, okay. He say, 1991, Ngamu ayamu kufota, panko loko. You know, and President Kaunda didn't believe that he can lose. Yeah. That's why he actually didn't see, you know, that it was challenging for him to call for an early election because he was too confident. Mm. Now, he lost the moment. He misread the mood. People had moved on. People were fatigued. People didn't, didn't want all of that. They needed a change. Mm. And so um, President Kaunda called for an early election. The rest is history. history. He lost the following of the people. He became too big. And he felt it, Zambia and him is phone and SIM card. Mm. That no one can dislodge him. Mm. But the power of the people, it is the people who need to decide. And I like the fact that for the first time, maybe President Kaunda didn't realize this. When the people were voting against the frog, they really were crying for change. Mm. But when he assented to that law that to, let's go back to Mount Patism, then the people said, now we can show you that even then we were voting for a frog. And so when the MMD came, people needed to show President Kaunda the door out. Mm. President Chiluba? President Chiluba started very well um, under multipartism. Um, and also, I think he tried to create a, a, a balance in terms of his uh, you know, cabinet. And one of the things that I liked about President Ch uh, Chiluba is the fact that he was a trade unionist. Mm. But he, he understood the power of professionalism. So you had the professors in his cabinet, you had uh, people who understood business, the Penzas, and all of them. He assembled that cabinet. That sort of really gave him the right advice that any president needed at such a critical time. Remember, our economy was on its knees. We were highly indebted. The, the hippie thing and all of that, we, we were just, and President Chiluba needed to take the nation through all this privatization, okay? Um, and uh, restructure the, the, the economy to make it become private sector 
uh, driven. There was a huge mindset shift. Um, and so that was key, that was necessary. But obviously also uh, towards the end of his uh, you know, presidency, you saw the debt crisis that we, we, we found ourselves in um, as, a, as a nation uh, that uh, you know, made it very difficult for the nation to, uh, to, to operate and function you know, you know, properly. But because the democracy and the institutions were very strong, and the president allowed others, and in fact, you know, uh, his subsequent successor, you know, Mwanawasa, also saw the need to allow strong, uh, you know, professionals to be involved. We saw this push for debt write-off until, at some point, even way past the the the, the presidents of uh, President Chiruba, we saw the nation coming back to a place where we had zero debt. Mm. as a nation. It's on the um, backdrop of what President Struber laid as a, a as strong a foundation, foundation mm. where you saw even freedom of expression, freedom of speech. I like President Struber also for one thing. When they say a lot of bad things ab ab about him, when you hear him call for a press conference, he will not talk about those things. He will talk about the substantive things that people want to, to hear. We are in a space and time and dispensation where you would have a press conference and people will focus more about what someone said about them and not what they are promising to do for the nation. President Chiruba will just laugh it over. <laughs> come on, guys. Come mm. on, guys. You know, you, need, you needed a president with thick skin mm. like that. You needed a president that knew how to network. and. Uh, and, uh, but also the, maybe the danger for the president uh, Chiluba also, he became too much of a darling of the West. And this is the problem that I'm beginning to see with our president uh, wanting to be so much a darling of the, of, the, of the West. And you forget you know, what is needed and the people that put you in power. Your number one commitment, it was the people who voted for you. So President Chiluba had his own strengths, but he also had his own Weaknesses. weaknesses. You've already reviewed Mwanawasa a bit. You can just continue with Mwanawasa. Yes, you know, President Mwanawasa, um, you know, that man, not much was expected from him. But I think he proved every single person who was writing him off and said, let me show you. They used, he would say, uh, they, they are calling me a, a cabbage, but I am actually a steak. <laughs> you know, he, he would joke about what people... We, yeah. are, we are saying about their hostile him. criticism. They are yes. hostile criticism, and that's how he watered down all the all the critics. But the delivery is what really distinguished President Mwanawasa. He fought corruption, and he fought the debt, and all of these things. He was a man who was truly walking the talk. For him, it was not about friendship. Remember, he was just a given the presidency by his predecessor. Mm. He turned around and said, you have to answer for what for you the did. following. Mm. National interest, not our, our friendship. But that really, um, of course, it maybe he had, the, he had his own uh, excesses. Mm. You know? It may have uh, been way too much. He needed to moderate uh, that fight so that you do not bring you know, the office of the former president to a place where it becomes a laughing stock. We, we need to ring, ring him fence that, that institution um, and find a way of preserving the integrity of uh, the former head of state. But also to say, for those who are in power, never do things, uh, you know, to, to the extent that you think you will stay there forever with impunity. Because at the end of the day, you must be held accountable for what you did, uh, and yet you are abusing the so-called immunity. Yeah. So I, I think what President Mwanawasa did, they opened our eyes to say, yeah, even a president after their office can be prosecuted. Can be prosecuted. Mm. But also we need to also learn to moderate and say, let's find a way of preserving the institution of the former president and not demonize those that because sometimes what they are doing it genuinely is in the interest of the of the, the country of the country but mm. there are some excesses that we have been seeing that are they are not speaking of the interest of the country mm. at all 
and those should be questioned. Rupia Bwezan Banda. Rupia Bwezan Banda, the man, look, the president came into his laps and uh, uh, he is one man who should have run with the presidency with the reverence that it deserved. But I see a president, uh, I'm sorry to say, um, with due respect to the departed, he was a little bit too casual in the manner that it is, he, 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 he presided mm -hmm. on the uh, affairs of the, of the, of the, of the economy. I, again, it is the Zambian people that will make the final decision. Regardless of the fact that he was only in power for perhaps three, three years, years. Mm. the Zambian people said this is not the kind of complexion we are looking for in a leader. And they showed him the, the door. But for me, he lost it because he just became too playful and he didn't take the presidency with the, um, you know, the, the, the reverence that it deserved and the, the trust that the Zambian people gave to him. And mm -hmm. so he, he had himself to blame for losing that particular president. Uh, Michael Chilufia Sata. Oh, Michael Chilufia Sata. The man who transformed the face of Zambia. I come from Chinsali, as I said. Mm -hmm. At least now when you go to Chinsali, you find a, a monument. I hope it will be completed. Robert Kapasamagasa University um, and, and, and a few other things. Whenever you go even to Mongo, you find the bridge there. If you go to Eastern, you see the road has been done. If you go to Mfue, that Mfue road uh, was a, a, a terrible ISO, you know. Uh, it was like hell run, you know. It was, uh, he linked Zambia, he connected Zambia, he opened up Zambia. He went into this overdrive of making sure that we have farming blocks and, uh, and all of these things. That man had the passion. Mm -hmm. to, a, to, to, to a certain degree, even when we talk about all the debt that people are singing about, we are highly indebted. Clearly, there is so much to point at what President uh, Michael Sata and his predecessor, um, his successor, his successor, rather, mm -hmm. his successor President uh, uh, Ed Galungu, mm -hmm. have been able to do with the debt that was contracted. Look at the airports. You know, there is so much to point at. Airport in Indola, airport in Livingstone, air, new airport in, in Lusaka, airport in Kasama. There is so much to point at. PF, in my view, President Michael Sata and President Lungo really had the vision to make Zambia become a nation to talk about. Just like uh, people have been talking about uh, uh, Kagame's country. Mm. Okay? Mm. And we, we have been heading in that direction. I do not think that we are going to go in that direction anymore because I do not see priority for infrastructure in, in, the, in the current um, administration. But on, in all honesty, President uh, Michael Chirufiasata will be remembered for being bold, decisive. Very little was expected from him, maybe because of his uh, limitations in terms of exposure to education and all of that. Mm -hmm. But he proved his... Uh, detractors wrong uh, he really was a, a king cobra and uh, um, he allowed the technocrats to recommend what should be done and we are here yes we are paying a heavy price for the debt we contracted but we are still driving on the roads that debt and we have hospitals like levy monowasa hospital and all of these things where yeah. people can go uh, all the chilenge level one uh, and uh, matelo uh, level one. There is so much to talk about. While mm. it is that we should be feeling the pinch to pay the debt, yeah. but let's have the comfort that there is something to say that's to what the out. debt mm. uh, built. I've seen you've reviewed Ed Galungu, but you can continue. So, President Ed Galungu, um, look, first of all, he, like uh, President uh, um, um, Arabi, was also handed down the presidency on the demise of, of, the predecessor. of the predecessor. So he had the foundation laid out for him. And uh, he came with a message that has been misunderstood by many. He said, I do not have a vision of my own. What he was trying to say is, I am continuing mm -hmm. on the journey that was started by my president and will continue. Many people called him names and demonized him and said he's saying he doesn't have a, a vision. They made, him, they made it look like it's a campaign message that you are voting for a man who has no vision. No, mm. what he was saying is, I do not have 
to start all over again. Mm. We are on this journey, trajectory of rebuilding the nation, and I will stay on this journey. And uh, that's where President uh, Lungu uh, stayed. In my view, as an independent observer, yeah. President Lungu um, l dropped the ball when he allowed cadres to become way too popular and too powerful that they could intimidate even the police. Mm. That is where I really think that uh, the, the ball was dropped. And I think uh, having had sight of the post-election, uh, you know, um, post-mortem report of what may have gone wrong within the, 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 the patriotic front. These are things that I've heard even the acting president, uh, Honorable um, Rubinda, saying, we apologize for this and we regret this happened. I think that at, at the rate we were going, if only the president had reined in and, uh, you know, let the police do their job and uh, put the cadres in their rightful place. President Lungu may have been the president even as we speak. He could have been uh, given back the, the presidency. But I think uh, a, a number of people were fatigued um, and uh, felt intimidated by the cadres. He himself is a good man. He continues to be a good person, a very unifying factor. That's why he's even unifying Oka today. Because it is just his natural gift to, to bring people, people together. together and unify. Mm. So he is a good man, but I think he let the board down to just allow the cadres to go in places where they take over markets and bus stops. And that is really what uh, uh, offended most voters. Mm. Uh, President Hakainde Ichlema. Oh, President Hakainde Ichlema, in my view, um, is one president that was voted with the uh, uh, apart from 1991, uh, results of President uh, Hichilema, I mean uh, Chiluba, President Hichilema is one president that was voted with a huge landslide mandate um, across the nation, not regional vote. Mm. He was voted by Zambians from across the country. He came with sweet talk. He knows how to talk. He knows how to convince. But now that he's in office for two and a half years, everyone is beginning to see that the president does not walk the talk. The president, President Nichilema, if he's ever going to succeed beyond one term, he needs to change from being a rhetorical speaker and become an implementer like Michael Sata. Michael Sata just said, we're going to open the, the country, and you started seeing things happening. The president keeps saying, we inherited dead, we inherited uh, corruption, and they keep f you know, fixing people and flushing people out of the civil service. You do not do that. There's such a, a, a very high and unprecedented purge. I have been privileged enough to see the transition from UNIP to MMD, yeah. MMD to PF, and now PF to UPND. To UPND. I am not young. I can clearly see that this is the first time that you are seeing civil service being kicked out almost at every level. Mm. And that is not right because the president must realize and remember that every Zambian, those 2.8 million that voted for him are Zambians mm. and they are not coming from one region, not from the Zambez region. They were coming from everywhere. And he cannot hide in the fact that, no, look at my cabinet, you have um, more Bemba speaking than uh, what? That, that's besides the point. It is what is happening. Those were already UPND supporters, so mm. they are just getting the dividends of their investment in the party that they supported for such mm. a long time. But it is what you are doing to the police, it is what you are doing to the civil service, it is what you are doing to all of this that uh, is uh, making people begin to realize that the president talks big but very slim and you know, slender. Mm. on delivery. Mm. Uh, that is the challenge that we have with uh, President Aga Inde Chilema. And also the fact that you say one thing and uh, tomorrow you see a totally manifestation and you say, you heard what I said. I don't know, uh, you know. So he would say the rule of law, but you see p police doing something else. Why doesn't he censure Mr. Musamba? 
So there are all of these things that are working against the president. From where I stand as a journalist, as, a, as an analyst of what is happening, it will take a miracle if the president does not change for him to see another term of office. President Hichilema, if he's not careful, is going to end up as a one-term president. And here is the reason why. It took three years for Zambians to kick out Arabi out of power. What would prevent Zambians to kick out a president who has been in power for five, five years? years. There, is re there is a history to, to point the way. And uh, if the president really wants to um, survive, let him begin to look at what he promised and let him be sincere. Because mm -hmm. there is so much rhetoric of freedom of the speech, freedom of press, and all of this. But what is happening behind the scenes is mm -hmm. totally different. Wonderful. Um, we've had a nice conversation, and I think we've journeyed your life and the life of this country through your lenses. What are your last words, Pastor Kennedy Mamwe? My last word, um, Ambassador, to the viewers of this podcast and the listeners, is that, as I have said always, we are Zambians. By the wisdom of God, he created us the way we are. East, west, north, south. Let's stop seeing things through the lenses of politics. Let's begin to see each one of us as Zambians. We will only build this nation when we embrace our diversity and not demonize each other. We need to do that. Secondly, my appeal to every Zambian is that do not be scared to speak out if you think what you are seeing is not correct. Yeah. I am very disturbed as a Zambian to see that people prioritize money other than the nation. As long as what I'm going to say is going to offend those uh, who are in power, even if you are saying the truth, then I will not say it because they will not appoint me to foreign missions. They will not appoint me to go and monitor <laughs> Uh, elections and as a, an elections observer, uh, they will not do this. So people have become self-imprisoned mm. so that they can access whatever they think they can access from the political table of expedience. We need mm. to run away from political expedience and let's go back to embracing the spirit of Ubuntu, of one Zambia, one nation, and let's look at each other as brothers and sisters. Let's look at each other as God having given us the privilege to be the ones to develop this nation. It is not the foreigners who are coming to develop this nation. They will come and steal. Mm. And I would like to appeal to our, to our government in power. Be careful what you do. Mm. Let it speak for you and let po posterity not judge you harshly after your days are done. If you are selling a mine, Mopani for instance, are you selling it with the interest of Zambians? At heart. If you are selling Mopan, are you sure you followed the law? Did you take it to parliament? Are you sure what you're doing is right? Mm. Are you sure no one will follow you after you leave government and you will not come and cry that I'm being prosecuted? At the moment, the Zambian people have vested their trust in you. Are you doing the right thing? Oh, wonderful. Today, dear viewers, we were hosting our pastor. Kennedy Mambwe, a veteran journalist, as you heard, a pastor, an entrepreneur, a businessman, and I think you learned one or two things. Pastor Mambwe, I'd like to thank you for, for joining us and for sharing your life with us. And to our dear viewers, until next time, God bless this country. God bless Zambia. God bless you. Shalom, shalom. <laughs>